again, as I said, they are getting what they want. They are getting on TV. They are seeing the images. They have the governor of Minnesota standing up here at 2.30 at night talking about how we're moving things around, and they're getting what they wish. But today they're going to get what they wish. They are going to have an overwhelming force of safety, security, and peace that the citizens of Minnesota and our surrounding uh, neighbors are going to provide to that. They are going to see a coordination to the best of our ability to make sure that this stops and it ends. That is going to happen, and I'm speaking with governors across the country who are in the same situation trading information. Many cities are where we were on Wednesday night, and they're expecting to be where we were on Thursday night. And that is a situation that must end. So, um, Minnesotans, um, this is a challenging time. Our great cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul are under assault by people who do not share our values, who do not value life and the work that went into this, and certainly are not here to honor George Floyd. And they need to, they need to see today that that line will stop and that order needs to be restored. With that, I want to uh, welcome up uh, Mayor Jacob Fry, the Minneapolis uh, mayor, and uh, someone who from the very beginning uh, saw this before any mayor in the country and requested uh, National Guard support earlier than any mayor in the country. And now the situation is requesting the next step of full mobilization. Mayor Fry. Thank you, Governor. The, the show of, of force tonight has got to be about safety, security, peace, and order. Our Minneapolis residents are, are scared and rightfully so. We've seen long-term institutional businesses overridden. We've seen community institutions set on fire. And I want to be very, very clear. The people that are doing this are not Minneapolis residents. They are coming in largely from outside of the city, from outside of the reason region to, to prey on everything that we have built over the last several decades. The dynamic has changed over the last several days. If you looked at Tuesday, it was largely peaceful protest, the vast majority peaceful, the vast majority of people from our city uh, with a small group of, of, of people looking to have intentional disturbance. Gradually that shift was made. Uh, and we saw more and more people coming from outside of the city. We saw more and more people looking to cause violence in our communities, and I have to say, it is not acceptable. If you're concerned, I get it. If you have family members or friends that are even considering protesting, this is no longer about protesting. This is no longer about verbal expression. This is about violence and we need to make sure that it stops. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. We have two crises that are sandwiched on top of one another. In order to make sure that we continue to have the necessary community institutions, we need to make sure that our businesses are protected, that they are safe, and that they are secure. So to our Minneapolis residents, we are with you. We will be mobilizing the largest force that has ever come forward in the state of Minnesota history to help. We understand that you're concerned. We want to be there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Carter. Thank you, Thank you Mayor Fry. Thank you. What we're experiencing right now is one of the most heartbreaking weeks uh, in American history, certainly in Minnesotan history. Uh, we woke up at the beginning of this week uh, to, uh, as we all know, a disgusting, disturbing video of Mr. George Floyd being wrongfully killed. He was unarmed. Uh, he was uh, not aggressive. Uh, he begged for his life. He called for his mom. And, and bystanders screamed, this man is dying. And over the course of a 10-minute video, 
we see the life squeezed out of Mr. Floyd. Anger over his death is understandable. Sadness, pain, heartache, frustration is legitimate. We have in our community right now an enormous number of people of all ages, of all races, of all backgrounds, who agree that Mr. Floyd should still be alive. We have in our community a, a, an enormous number of people of all ages, of all races, of all backgrounds, of all neighborhoods, who are looking to see not only one but four, all four of the officers involved in his death be fully held accountable. We have an enormous number of people in our community who are, are heartbroken by the fact that the name George Floyd does not stand alone in history, but that it joins a too long and too rapidly growing list of names of unarmed, unaggressive African American men who've lost their lives wrongfully at the hands of law enforcement. And the frustration that time and time again we've seen no one held accountable. We have an enormous amount of legitimate frustration of people who ask, when, how long will it take? People who ask, how egregious does it have to be? People who ask, how blatant does it have, how well documented does it have to be for someone to be held accountable for George Floyd's murder? That frustration, that pain is real and it's legitimate. And to all of the people in our community who believe what I just said, who, who, who wholeheartedly need the world to hear that Mr. Floyd should be alive, that someone should be held accountable, and that we as a community, we as a culture, we as a society must do everything we can imagine to keep this from happening again, we stand with you. I stand with you. There are many, many ways for us to work together in a constructive manner that builds our communities, that empowers our communities to speak up with a loud voice. The world is listening. There are opportunities for us to do that in a constructive manner. Unfortunately, there are also those among us who would seek to use this moment, who would seek to use his death as an excuse as a cover to agitate for the destruction of those same communities that have been most traumatized by George Floyd's death. Those same communities that have been most traumatized by the dual crisis of a COVID-19 pandemic and an economic crisis that we're facing right now. Those same communities are being re-traumatized right now as our black-owned barbershops, as our immigrant-owned restaurants, as our local, generational, family-owned businesses are damaged and destroyed night after night. This must stop. I know the governor, I know Mayor Fry, myself, wholeheartedly support the right of people to protest, the right of free speech, for people to say what they believe about the world, to speak up and say and participate in making this world a better place, that right to speak stops at destruction of lives, destruction of property, destruction of livelihood. In St. Paul last night, and across our Twin Cities, a curfew went into effect. Because we had a relative stillness in St. Paul, we didn't make an enormous number of arrests, but every single person we arrested last night, I'm told, was from out of state. What we are seeing right now is a group of people 
who are not from here. As I talk to my friends uh, who have been in this movement for a very long time, who wake up in this movement every day, and I ask them what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're hearing, to a person, I hear them say, we don't know these folks. We don't know these folks who are agitating. We don't know these folks who are inciting violence. We don't know these folks who are first in to break a window. And those folks who are agitating and inciting are taking advantage of the pain, of the hurt, of the frustration, of the anger, of the very real and legitimate sadness that so many of our community members feel to advocate for the destruction of our communities. I echo the governor's statements. I echo the mayor's statements in that our police officers, our firefighters are facing something they've never faced before. That alone would be very, very difficult to address. One thing that I've learned about the world, about Minnesota, and certainly about St. Paul, is every time ugliness raises its head in our community. The beauty of community, that beautiful spirit that Paul Wellstone once spoke about when he said we all do better when we all do better, arises across the Twin Cities yesterday, across St. Paul yesterday. We saw countless neighbors show up for each other. We saw people show up with a broom and a bucket, a rag to clean, and just work together. They weren't cleaning their cousin's store or their uncle's store. They were just coming to help each other to clean up our city. Over the last couple of months, thanks to the fact that we in Minnesota have a governor who took strong action early to protect Minnesotans in this pandemic crisis, we showed that togetherness by staying home. We showed that togetherness by honoring the, the, the stay-at-home orders uh, that our governor has, uh, has, has, has executed. And those efforts resulted in saving lives in our community. Right now, today, this week in Minnesota, we must show that same sense of togetherness. We must show that same sense of unity. We must show that same sense of, of community and cohesion as we stand forward to say we will not accept the brutal killing of unarmed black men. We will not accept George Floyd's death, and we will not accept the destruction of our communities either. Those two things, those two values, those two goals are not in competition. They're not in conflict with one another. Actually, they're one and the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Carter. Commissioner Harrington. I'm John Harrington, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. The Department of Public Safety was given the mission by Governor Tim Wallace to restore order and to maintain and keep the peace. Uh, we have assembled the largest civil policing authority in the history of Minnesota. I've been in policing for 40 years, uh, and, and there has never been a time when I have had as many officers, deputies, and state law enforcement officials come together for a single mission. We are working together under a unified command to make sure that we can be out there to keep the peace. But I will tell you that, that we have seen a change over the last couple of days. We have seen from the earliest demonstration, which were peaceful demonstrations that were largely demonstrations of where people were trying to express the horror and the trauma of having Mr. Lloyd's life snuffed out, I'm not seeing peaceful demonstrations, and I am not seeing, frankly, any empathy or any heart for Mr. Lloyd or for the communities that he loved and the communities he belonged to. Last night, we saw not only a change in the in the temperament and the approach of the of what I will call rioters. They weren't demonstrating for a cause. They were not protesting 
for injustice. They were simply bent on destruction of property, and they were bent on trying to hurt people. And they didn't really care who they hurt in the interim. We had multiple shots fired in both cities coming out of the rioters group. We had officers and National Guard officers, National Guardsmen and women shot at. We had improvised explosive devices used to injure state troopers, DNR, and others. We saw them break into post offices and we saw them try and destroy not only public property, but repeatedly set fires to private property with absolutely no, I mean this, absolutely no sense that there were people who, that was not just the, their shop, it was not just their business, but that was their home. That's where their, that's where their sweat and blood and life was based out of, and they burned it to the ground with no second thought. We also saw a shift in the numbers last night. As I said, this, we put together 2,500 public safety folks between National Guard and cops and state troopers and everybody else. It, it, that is an enormous number of, of law enforcement people. And we were confronted with tens of thousands of rioters. I want to repeat that. That little group that, that started out uh, embedding themselves into George Lloyd's memorial service is no longer the little group. It is, in fact, the group that is throwing projectiles, throwing batteries, firing into crowds, and setting fires and attacking firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, sheriff's department, and National Guardsmen as they seek to provide safety in our community. We have watched these groups grow both in brazenness and we've watched them also grow in challenging approaches that we have had to adapt to. We have watched them take on efforts where literally there are 5,000 of them surrounding a building, trashing the building, and then when confronted, running back under the cover of darkness into residential areas. We have watched them try and destroy downtowns, and it's hard to drive through one of our downtowns without seeing the plywood that's up whether it was as a preventative measure or simply to patch the holes that they had punctured into the buildings that support and are the, the, the anchors of our downtown areas. We are adapting to their tactics. We have made more arrests virtually every day, and we have focused on the fact that as this is not a protests, where this is not a demonstration, while that we will always, and I repeat, always respect everyone's First Amendment rights, those rights stop at the end of a Molotov cocktail thrown into a, an open business. Those rights stop at the point that you loot the liquor store in the neighborhood. Those rights stop when you loot the gas station, the little mom and pop gas station in a neighborhood. And Minnesota Public Safety and Minnesota's National Guard are gearing up. We are getting bigger and we are changing our approach because this is intolerable and we are coming to stop it. I don't want anyone to make any mistakes about that. We will make sure that those folks that come out today that want to mourn Mr. Lloyd's passing, that their rights are in fact protected. But these rioters are in fact trampling on those rights by making it too dangerous for good people to speak their minds. 
And we cannot, as a community, we cannot, as Minnesotans, we cannot, as members of the Twin Cities community, tolerate that. So you can expect to see law enforcement, the National Guard, from state, county, and local in lockstep tonight, preventing, responding, rescuing, and repelling attacks on our businesses, on our personal safety, and on the personal liberties of the Twin Cities area. At this time, we'd introduce General Jensen, the Minnesota National Guard. Well, I don't think I could uh, speak uh, with any more passion uh, than the four gentlemen that just spoke in front of me. So what I will do is just give you a quick update on the last 48 hours of the Minnesota National Guard's participation in this operation. 24 hours ago, we had approximately 400 guardsmen on state active duty in support of the governor's executive order. As mentioned by the governor yesterday, we reached a part or reached a peak that the Minnesota National Guard had never been at before. Over 700 soldiers and airmen mobilized in support of the governor's executive order. And while it was the largest mobilization, and as Commissioner Harrington described, the largest law enforcement operation in Minnesota's history, it was not enough. Early yesterday, we began mobilizing additional soldiers. And we expect, to, and we expect by noon to have 2,500 soldiers and airmen mobilized and in support of the governor's executive order. But that's not enough. The governor just announced the full mobilization of the Minnesota National Guard for the first time since World War II. What does that mean? It means we're all in. We're all in with the two mayors to my left, their citizens, their communities that they represent. And we're all in to the two law enforcement professionals to my right, supporting them to ensure we bring stability and peace back to our two great cities. But even that's not enough. As Governor Walls just laid out, we had a conversation with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we are requesting national level resources to come to the state to make key contributions to the operation that Commissioner Harrington has laid out. So to our, our two mayors and to our two law enforcement professionals and to you, Governor, the Minnesota National Guard is all in. Colonel Wanger. Thank you, Governor. I don't intend on rehashing the ground that has been covered by all the folks up here saying the important things they said, but I do stand here as Chief of the Minnesota State Patrol to say that we have done something that we've never done in the history of our organization all the way back to 1929 in terms of the mobilization of our state troopers from all across Minnesota that have come to the metro area to do whatever we can to get back to what we believe in as an organization and as the Minnesota State Patrol, that we reflect our core values of respect, integrity, courage, honor, and excellence. That's who we are, and that's who we believe Minnesotans are too. And our job is to get out there in the middle of the mission that we're confronted with right now to stop the criminal behavior that we have been seeing and to prevent the criminal behavior that we regretfully anticipate we will see tonight and into the near future. We're working as hard as we can because I've heard from plenty of Minnesotans that they don't like what they see. They don't think that what is going on represents who we are in Minnesota and they want to help. 
So we need your support. We need your prayers. And we, we need your thoughts as we work as hard as we possibly can to get Minnesota out of this current situation and stabilize so that we can move forward and make the state what we believe it should be, one that is safe for every single person who lives or visits this wonderful state. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Langer. Minnesotans, before I take questions, I'd just like to, I think you got an assessment of what's on the ground. I, I am certainly not going to make light of, of the seriousness of where we're at. For those who are wondering if we were timid or something happened, I think you need to understand, even going into last night, this was the largest force and exhausted much of what we had going into that. The professionalism and the tactics were by the book. One of the things is, when you're a force of good and law and order, you play by the rules. When you are bent on destruction and harm and chaos, you don't have to do that. And it makes it very, very difficult. And I think it's important to note, too, that this call and the call-up of the guard and the attempt to do this is only going to make it more difficult tonight. The people listening do not see this as a deterrent. They are not somehow searching their soul and deciding that this was stupid and destructive and wrong of what they did. This is the challenge they were looking for. The call will go out to join, and the call will be there to try and break the back of civil society and the people putting it forward. So Minnesotans, I'm not telling you and, and trying to make this any lighter. This is going to be very difficult. And to set expectations, they will slip away and they will start fires. They will do that. No matter how many people we have on the ground with where they were at, our goal is, is to decimate that force as quickly as possible that they have, is to protect life, property, and restore that order. But they will bring everything that they have to this. So I think it is very clear, and I would make that statement, um, and it will use social media. They will do whatever they want to do. Um, our expectation is to have the curfew in place. Our expectation is to restore order. It will be a dangerous situation on the streets tonight. We will do everything in our power to restore that order that Minnesotans expect, that Minnesotans demand. But as each of these folks said, it is going to take all of us. I am grateful to our neighbors, our fellow Americans who are helping and who are sending prayers and thoughts to the fellow governors. I am grateful to the president and the administration for continuing to be on the line and offer and provide assistance when needed. And I am most grateful to Minnesotans. We built this state. We built the North Star. Everything that we believe in, these people are trying to destroy. So if you are on the streets tonight, it is very clear. You are not with us. You do not share our values. And we will use the full strength of goodness and righteousness to make sure that this ends. With that, I'd be glad to answer any questions along with the folks up here. Governor, Peter. Could you be more specific about numbers? I don't think you're saying that 10,000 people have come in from out of state or that every bit of violence was done by people who were coming in from out of state. So where does, did that sort of cross over from earlier demonstrations to what's going on now? And, and again, what kind of numbers are you talking about, and what can you share yeah, I'll let these folks go. intelligence? Yeah, no, it's a good question. But Peter's question is about how do we know this. And I want to just be very clear. As I said earlier in the week, this is not about saying, oh, this isn't us. It's everybody from everywhere else. We understand that the catalyst for this was Minnesotans. And Minnesotans, Minnesotans' inability to deal with inequality inequities and quite honestly the racism that has persisted. I, I am not denying that. But what we're at right now, and we're trying to get numbers on this, and I will try and what I'm asking the media to help us on, we're going to start releasing who some of these people are. And they'll be able to start tracing that, uh, that history of where they're at and what they're doing on the dark web and how they're organizing. But I'm not trying to say that. I think our best estimate right now that I heard is about 20 percent is what we think are Minnesotans and about 80 percent are outside. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to deflect in any way. I'm not trying to say there aren't Minnesotans amongst this group. We know that we have folks that, that may not be there, too. But 
the vast majority right now, and I think the, the difference is, and this is where Mayor Carter, Mayor Fry spoke eloquently on this, um, our heart and our solidarity are with folks who understand what happened Monday night to George Floyd um, must, must see justice and we must fix. But these folks are not them. So I, I, that's a good question, and we'll get more data. Peter, you want to follow up on that? All right. Yes, sir. Uh, you and Care from Minnesota Public Radio. I mean, who are these people, and what's happening right now in terms of you going after them? Yeah. John, you want to talk about that? As we've begun making arrests, we have begun analyzing the data of who we've arrested and begun actually doing what you would think is almost very similar to our COVID. It's, it's contact tracing. Uh, who are they associated with? Uh, who, what platforms are they advocating for? Uh, and we have seen things like white supremacist organizers who have posted things on platforms about coming to Minnesota. Uh, we are checking to see, do the folks that we, have, that we have made arrests on and that we have information, are they connected to those platforms? We have seen flyers about protests where folks have talked about they're going to get their loot on tonight. Uh, and we're checking to see, are they part of an organized criminal organization? Uh, and if so, what is that organization and, and how, is that, how, is, how are they organized? Uh, we have been working with both our state, our county, our local, and our, uh, our federal partners to start looking at issues around, uh, is this organized crime? Is this an organized cell of terror? Where are the, where do these folks, where is the linkage is what we're doing. And so we are in the process right now of building that information network, building that intel effort so that we can link these folks together, figure out what the organizations that have created this, and then just understand how do we go after them legally. Uh, that is absolutely part and parcel of our mission. We are, in fact, public safety, and we recognize that there are, there are legal issues that are involved here but we are not going to tolerate the violence and the destruction that they're using as a cover for the other illegal activity. Larry Porlock, you said you're going to release names, you're going to release information. What, what, how will that happen? What form? No. I expect that we'll, we're going to be able to release some of the names of those folks that have been arrested uh, and some of the background information that we have pulled together, and we hope to be able to do that today. I think putting that in the media, too, is, is the help on that. And uh, the, the frustration we feel about who are they, why do they do this, and it was one of the things I've asked them to to get this out clearly. Uh, next question, please. Uh, Governor, can we talk a bit more about your uh, conversation with Secretary Esper this morning and what we might expect in terms of uh, federal military assistance? Yeah, this is the second conversation in 24 hours with uh, Defense Secretary Esper and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Milley. Uh, I was joined on that call by our leadership team, uh, General Jensen being the lead with, with military affairs. We're looking at what, what are the resources they have. Is there, is there signal intelligence that we can get from them? Are there things that they can provide us? And then talking about the mechanisms that we use in the National Guard, I think it's really important, again, for folks to think about the uniqueness of our nation of protecting civil liberties is to make sure that civilian control of the military, and especially inside the United States, is carried out by civilians, by citizen soldiers, by National Guard. This goes back to 1804 and the Insurrection Act, and when we redid it in 2007. I was the lead author of it in 2007, so I understand very clearly the militarization of a civilian population is, is a deep concern. That's why we're accessing, and they're helping us access all these uh, assets through the, through the National Guard and our surrounding states. They also were able to provide their intelligence support of what they're seeing, what they're signal intercepting. They have, obviously, from NSA and others, massive support to be able to see who these operators are. And, and I think for Minnesotans, as you saw this, and it's been a, a 48 hours playing out, just thinking about this, the wars that we fought to protect our nation, um, the, the war on terrorism, all of that, over the last 72 hours, these people have brought more destruction and more terror to Minnesota than anybody in our history. That's who we're up against. When you see them out there wearing a T-shirt or a baseball hat and walking down, that is not who they are. That is not who this is. And so I think it's very clear to change your mindset as we're changing ours and keeping that line again of the respect for peaceful protesting, it has morphed over the last 48 hours to very something very different. Yes. 
the um, curfew did little to stop the destruction that happened last night. You're talking about how you're going to change tactics and the amount of law enforcement that you have here, yet we have crews out all night. We didn't see law enforcement until well after 11 o'clock. Yeah, so and it's the question I brought to you. It, it is a sheer numbers. I mean, the, this is never, there were more law enforcement and they were actively engaged, as they would tell you, like no time in the 90 year history of that. That's how big this was. One of the things about a curfew is, much like I continue to say, civil society is not maintained just by laws and the threat of punishments. It's maintained by the sense of a social compact that we share the same values. What the curfew does is it gives us a legal authority to make the arrests of people who are out there to start separating that. So I would just be very clear to people tonight, what I believe, and I think setting the expectations on this, what you've seen in previous nights I think will be dwarfed by what they will do tonight. And if you are an innocent bystander going out there tonight, you will be swept up in this. We will do the best. But thinking about the logistics of arresting someone who is in a force wants to break the line. And what we're talking about is, under the tactics that they use, if we step into a crowd who's someone who threw a Molotov cocktail at us, the minute you do that, they're surrounding those folks. They're making sure and they're cutting us off. They're trying to escalate a situation where deadly force is used, and then chaos ensues. So the question about, are you out there? Have you put enough on there? Just to be very clear, the mayor of Minneapolis requested National Guard support earlier than anybody in the country. National Guard was mobilized at a level unseen in Minnesota history by Wednesday morning. The forces on the ground last night were dwarfing anything we've seen from riots, from, from the Hormel strike, going back in Minnesota history. So you're seeing the sheer numbers of where the protesters were at, and that is our job and what we're doing today to pull in all these resources. But just to be very clear, those who say, federalize and bring them in. You're talking about 400 people under that scenario and also fundamentally changing how we go about policing and striking that balance. So if it were the case, throw everything at this, send out 100,000 people and go out and arrest every one of these people, um, that's the situation you would see on the streets. So there has to be tactical. It has to be with the support. We have to get the help from the public to making sure that if you are not involved in this and what I would ask today is, if you know where these people are sleeping today, let us know and we will execute warrants. Let us know if there's someone that's there to do this. Start talking it back. If you know someone was down there protesting, help us. Help us. Call that in. Tell us who they were. They're not from Minneapolis, but they're staying down here. They're doing this. They're coming in. Next question. Yes. A couple of questions. Uh, how many arrests have been made so far? And uh, do you, how would you attempt to go about enforcing the curfew, putting law enforcement in harm's way in this situation? I'll like say this that. for the commissioner before he comes up here, and this is one, again, as I think all of us, is being as transparent as possible. I'm speaking to Minnesotans now about articulating a plan. Some of this is going to be the tactics that we use. Um, these folks are very smart. If I tell exactly and he tells you, they will adjust and they will adapt. We changed in two nights. They changed with us. So I'll let John talk about the number of arrests and maybe some of the basic uh, techniques you're seeing. On the St. Paul side, I, as best, uh, and these are all preliminary numbers, we had around 20 arrests made on the St. Paul side. Uh, over half of those were for burglary, and when we talk about burglary, if you can think about those grocery stores and those Walgreens and all of the, li the liquor stores and the pharmacies that have been broken into, uh, as you look at all the plywood that's up, or up and about, uh, they were significant numbers for burglary, and then there was a about a, a third of that total was for curfew violations in addition to that. On the Minneapolis side, I believe there was, once again, close to 20, I think between 15 and 20 there. Uh, and once again, uh, much of that was for curfew violations and or for destruction of property. Uh, so that, that's the numbers we have so far. We recognize that that's only essentially St. Paul and Minneapolis. Uh, we really need to get both Hanover County booking numbers, Ramsey County booking numbers, and we recognize that uh, as there were fire bombings done throughout the metro area, that we actually have, we're going to have to tap into Washington, Dakota, Anoka County also, because we understand that they also had crimes committed in their jurisdictions. Does the mayor agree that anyone out tonight after 8 o'clock is aiding and abetting these folks and providing cover for these folks? And are you telling legitimate 
protesters to not help provide cover? Peter, I didn't catch the second part of your question there. Are you, are you telling folks in your cities that they are providing cover for this activity when they are out after curfew and that they should stop doing that? Yes, by being out tonight, uh, you are most definitely helping those who seek to wrong our city. And let me be clear about this curfew. Uh, you know, the people in our city, the residents of Minneapolis, they are not abiding by the curfew because they don't want to get arrested. They're abiding by the curfew because they understand that it's the right thing to do for our city. Londoners during World War I and World War II didn't turn off their lights because the government told them to. They turned off their lights because they recognized it was the right thing to do for their city and in their country. And that's exactly the same thing as to what we're seeing right here. And let me be clear about the numbers that, that we've seen. You know, early on, there were so many questions about why don't we just arrest our way out of this on Wednesday uh, and Thursday. And why don't we have an officer placed at each and every business? If we were to place an officer at all of the businesses that we were seen getting a, a, attacked, uh, and looted, it would be one officer facing, in some instances, 100 people coming in. If they were to arrest one, the other 99 walk right by. We certainly don't want to incite additional violence by triggering some form of force. Uh, and so this became a very difficult situation that was not about planning or strategy, but about math. I want to be very clear. We did not have the numbers early on. This was about math. On Wednesday afternoon, uh, I called the governor as soon as I heard from, my, from our chief, Arredondo, and requested assistance from the National Guard. We are very appreciative to have those resources. Uh, we definitely need the numbers because we're, we can't do it alone. And now that we've, we do have a very concerted and unified contingent right now, uh, and so tonight, yes, uh, most definitely abide by the curfew. We'll need everybody complying. If I can ask Mayor Carter to respond to that. Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, and w I think we've all made the distinction uh, that there are people who are uh, seeking to peacefully protest, uh, and there are other people who are uh, agitators who are seeking to agitate and incite violence. The, the problem that we're hearing uh, from a lot of our friends who have been in the movement here in, say, in Minnesota for a very long time uh, is that you have somebody who will go forward and, and, and break a window or try to start a fire or something, uh, and as the governor mentioned, then go run back behind the people who are trying to peacefully protest and use them essentially as human shields. Uh, and so, you know, I hear people saying, you know, the, the, the curfew didn't work uh, to stop uh, the, the, the incidents that happened last night. Uh, to be clear, uh, I, I don't think there's an expectation that people who are here from out of town to incite violence are going to say, oh, shoot, we can't go out there because uh, the mayor uh, implemented an 8 o'clock curfew. Uh, what that's designed to do uh, is separate uh, those well-meaning uh, community members uh, who are heartbroken, who ha are, are feeling legitimate anger and sadness, and ask them, as the mayor just said, to stay home, to stay out of that so that we can separate uh, who are the people in our community who are hurting, who need to be able to peacefully express their First Amendment rights, uh, from who are the people in our community uh, who are looking to break a window or start a fire or create destruction in our communities. Uh, so I would echo exactly what the mayor just said. Just by virtue of being out in that space, just by virtue of being a part of a crowd that the people who would hope to destroy our communities can hide in, that, yes, would be uh, aiding those who are attempting to destroy our communities. That's the purpose of the curfew. Thank you. We will gather at noon. I would ask this before we go. We'll gather at noon. One second, please. We'll gather at noon with civil rights leaders, members of this movement, folks who understand this clearly, and, and have them speak to you, too, about this very question. I'm sorry. Please One go ahead. One more follow-up question, very important if possible. When you talk about full mobilization, how many National Guard troops are you willing to accept? Have you asked for? Can we get specific? This might be a distinction on when you're in the Guard and when you're ready to deploy. 
Yeah, we have a, you know, approximately 13,200 Minnesota Guardsmen now. All of them are not qualified to be fully mobilized because they haven't conducted basic training or their MO, uh, military occupational skill uh, training. Um, but when the, the governor tasked me this morning with full mobilization, his expectation is that every soldier and airman, regardless of job, uh, of military job, is available uh, for this operation. So at, at this time, I don't have a number to give you. The top end, as I mentioned, 13,200. The bottom end, bottom end is where we are right now, 2,400. So it'll be in between uh, those two numbers as, as we work uh, as we work through this. Thank you. Last no. question. So the president has offered federal troops to come in. Has he been consulted with you on that? And are you going to accept it? And what kind of a precedent is that going to set? Yeah, and that was going back to an earlier question, the question of the president offering that. And this has happened before of where they, they put their ready, their 82nd Airborne and some of those on on readiness. Um, yes, we've been consulted early. I spoke uh, to the president himself uh, two days ago. Uh, I have spoken twice with uh, Secretary Esper and Joint Chief Staff Chairman Milley, along with the guidance of General Jensen, um, about what that would look like. As I said earlier, um, the resources there provide us in uh, material resources. There is a mechanism with the National Guard, which we are relying on, which is quicker and better and much easier to do, is to rely on our state partners around us to provide that. Federal troops, again, not from the community, and, and I think for people to think about this, they're not talking about mobilizing the entire United States Army. We're probably talking in the neighbor of several hundred. We can get more troops quicker than that by doing this, but that is an option that was put out there, and it's support that goes with us. Uh, at this time, Minnesotans, we will be back here. We'll bring some faith leaders to talk to you about it. We have planned demonstrations today, um, true demonstrations, true expressions of grief, true calls to heal our community and work. We will be out there, and the folks that are here will be out there to support that and protect that and honor that right. Um, but we're asking those people, as soon as those are done, to disperse, to be out of the area, and, and to not do what the mayors both clearly and eloquently, and I would associate myself exactly with them, if you're out after 8 o'clock, you are, you are aiding and abetting these folks. You are helping make it easier for them, and you're giving them the cover of that exactly they want. So, Minnesotans, that uh, this is an unprecedented time we're in. Um, it may be an unprecedented time in American history. Uh, to my fellow governors who are experiencing this and the mayors, uh, we stand with you as Americans who value decency, who value community, who value uh, the rule of law, and, and we stand together. This is an opportunity for our nation to truly become united about this, to isolate those folks who are meant to bring us harm, and to learn from this experience and become stronger. We'll be back with you shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Mayors.